Hi, I'm Sean Katz, and I am the director and producer of Underground Inc., The Rise and Fall. That is a trailer from the soon-to-be-released documentary, Underground Inc., The Rise and Fall of Alternative Rock. And this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, a London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and today we're in for a real treat as we discuss the 1980s and 90s alternative rock scene. Uh, Joining us is Sean Katz, director and producer of Underground Inc., The Rise and Fall of Alternative Rock. Uh, Sean, uh, welcome to Factual America. Hi, Matthew. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's, uh, what, it's eight in the morning there, isn't it? And, or it where are you, in Sydney? Sunday morning as well. So yeah, so, so what's Sunday like? Sunday is just raining. It's just dark and gloomy outside. So if I wasn't talking to you, I'd probably be sleeping in or watching a movie right now. <laughs> See, we've, we've done you a favor, haven't we? Um, <laughs> so uh, as we've already said, uh, Underground Inc., The Rise and Fall of Alternative Rock, uh, officially uh, came out in 2019. Um, got some uh, quote, great quote here from David Griffiths at uh, Lilithia Reviews. If Katz's aim was to show the world that for every Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins, there was an equally as good band who were overlooked but kept slaving away, then it certainly achieves that. Uh, it's releasing on March 23rd. It's available in the US and Canada on DVD and all major cable and VOD platforms, including, but not limited to, iTunes, Amazon, Fandango Now, Voodoo, and Google Play. I've also been advised to say check local cable listings for availability. Uh, so thanks so much, Sean, for coming on to the podcast. Congratulations on this finally uh, having a wider release. And uh, thanks for making this film. I got to relive some of my misspent youth, although I'm now thinking it wasn't so misspent having seen your film. Um, <laughs> so, Sean, maybe uh, give us a little background. What is... Uh, I mean, it seems pretty obvious given the title, but what is Underground Inc. all about? Well, for me, it was trying to communicate to maybe hopefully a larger amount of people that when you think about 90s music, it's not just Smashing Pumpkins. It's not just Rage Against the Machine or Green Day or whoever, who've all made great albums, obviously. But there was a whole sea of other bands basically we're talking like two or three generations worth of bands who were completely fubbed off by these major corporations who if they didn't sell as many albums as green day or as many as i don't know tool or or whatever big band was happening at the time they were their career was basically over so and in many cases so many of these smaller bands were more accomplished than the more well-known band so I was working in a record store and I had access to everything that was coming out and I saw these bands who had only come out with one album and I, I was I wanted to know more I was like I need my fix where is the second album and that's how I got into exploring this whole story okay and when you hear I mean um, you know maybe I hate to do this actually there's this part of me that just wants to throw all the notes out the window and just because it would be more in spirit with what I think we're going to be talking about today in terms of alternative rock of, of the of that era but when you you know when people hear alternative uh they hear different things uh, and for you how would you define alternative music i must say uh i know that that was used as a catch-all phrase for anything that was sort of post-punk related or, yeah, or, yeah. or underground punk inspired or something but i feel like the alternative label really got associated with what was acceptable to be played on radio at a certain point, because Mm. there was a time where suddenly by, let's say 1997, where you turned on the radio and that kind of music didn't sound anything like it did just uh, three years ago. It didn't sound like it at all. So I would probably prefer to maybe, let's talk about underground punk or, or whatever other label you want to, use which is not in more of the spirit of the kind of music mm. i'm talking about yeah i or mean I th- well i think it's funny because i you know i was i was explaining uh trying to explain to my teenage children why i was so into this film uh <laughs> you know and uh, also explaining different music and i you know you get thinking people talk about punk post-punk college hardcore whatever you want to call it but don't you think it's just these these sort of subgenres are these just music journalists trying to uh, 
I don't know, classify things, pigeonhole music that in a lot of ways defied being uh, pigeonholed? Um, I definitely think all of the labels that came up uh, around that time were definitely definite result of journalists. I mean, I don't think any of those Seattle bands could find themselves as grunge. That was most definitely a, a term invented by the media or maybe by the industry. And um, it, it was the same with alternative. I mean, I don't need to repeat the whole alternative to what line. Everyone's heard that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely do agree. Yeah. And then I think um, you've got, uh, I mean, one thing that I think it captures well, and you've, um, I think there's a musician in the film, um, uh, Craig uh, Silverman, who's like, uh, was talking about that scene and in coming up, you know, this is, you know, pre Nirvana. Um, and he says, kids from different scenes were coming together and you couldn't call them anything. I mean, this was, uh, and, and that was certainly my own personal experience is going to music clubs and you'd see people of all sorts coming to these concerts. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, I, I'm a little bit younger than some of the people who were initially, who came of age during this music, but so a lot of the things that I'm saying are, are secondhand in a way, but I mean, yeah, you would go to a Jane's Addiction concert and you'd see like, um, like weird, whatever the version of Hipster was at the time, you'd see yeah. metal kids, you'd see punk kids, you'd see um like hippies you'd, you'd see uh, just a whole bunch of weird bunches of audiences yeah. which years before was like you know if you dress differently then get out you're not invited so that was a, a coming together of different um sub um groups of yeah. you know i forget the word but you know what i'm talking about i mean yeah you've got a great uh you've got i mean it's amazing you got steve albini on there i mean and uh I think he's got a great scene there too, where he describes what that scene was like, you know, uh, just all these different groups of people who are just, as I think, as he put it, not straight, <laughs> would not, uh, <laughs> you know, not fit in with whatever was mainstream, uh, all coming was, together. When, when I was filming that thing, when he, think, when he said the line about the dogs, yeah. I was trying so hard to not to burst out laughing. Uh, <laughs> that i was i was just like behind the camera going don't you laugh don't you dare laugh right <laughs> together but it was, it was yeah it was it was hilarious mm. and yet so how did nirvana change things because it's obviously they didn't happen in a vacuum this there's this threat well underground but thriving scene but how's how does nirvana change everything well, um, Nirvana was basically the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, when you talk about Nirvana becoming huge and Lollapalooza becoming huge and all that sort of, uh, you know, the, you know, the punk broke and everything like that, that was the result of 10 years of, you know, underground bands uh, breaking their backs and blazing trails and... Um, for better or worse, setting up a demographic that would be come huge like 10 years later. But I mean, there were, um, obviously when the first punk thing happened, that was driven more underground. And the I think around maybe some people would say 83, some people would say a little bit later, all these hardcore punk bands started, you know, playing mm. with different genres and incorporating elements of Black Sabbath or... or or Gang of Four, or whatever bands they liked into a more musical outlet, if you will. And, um, you know, it, you had all these weird bands coming up. Like, you had, like, bands like Huskadoo exactly. and Dinosaur Junior and, and all these bands that just didn't sound like anything that had happened before. And that eventually evolved into bands like, you know, the Butthole Surfers and Chili Peppers and, and right. bands that would become household names later on. So that's yeah. uh, how the vacuum didn't happen with Nirvana. And then, you know, you, you interview all these, all these musicians from all these bands. Um, I mean, did they, was it, was it like that? Was it like turning on a switch that they sense things change soon as, soon as Nirvana hit big? It really depends on who you speak to. I mean, there were so many yeah. people who I interviewed. For some people, they were a bit more blasé. They were like, oh yeah, the big brief Nirvana boom or <laughs> yeah, 
of hers, right? Mm -hmm. And then there were some people who said, oh yeah, man, I remember when they opened for the Chili Peppers and, and they played that song Teen Spirit and you're like, whoa, something's changing, man, which I, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I think um, there was a sense that um, there was that generational shift and I think that was definitely present. And I think a big part of the story that I cover in Underground Inc. is that because of a generational shift that happened, it, it sort of left the music industry a bit sort of not knowing what to do or not knowing what mm -hmm. the kids were into. And uh, then suddenly uh, a band like, let's, let's, let's refer to Soundgarden instead. Or, yeah, or one yeah, of yeah, certainly. That, um, and when, you know, Nirvana or, uh, sorry, Soundgarden or Alice in Chains or whoever suddenly became huge, uh, they just, they just went with it. They just, okay, sign everybody. And um, uh, so I forgot your original question, but basically it, it was the result of the record company uh, basically responding to a very clear generational shift that had happened. Okay. Hold that thought, because I think what we'll do is we'll go to an early break, and then we'll come back and uh, talk some more about alternative rock music with, with Sean Katz. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with director, producer, writer, editor, cinematographer, Sean Katz. Is there anything you didn't do on that film, Sean? <laughs> um, I didn't do any catering. <laughs> I think that may be the only credit you didn't get. Uh, so Underground Inc., The Rise and Fall of Alternative Rock, releasing on March 23rd. Uh, I will say it again, and it won't be the last time you hear it. Available in the U.S. and Canada on DVD and all major cable and VOD platforms, including iTunes, Amazon, Fandango Now, Vudu, and Google Play. Or check your local cable listings for availability. That should make uh, Andrew McKinnon, the publicist, happy. And I guess we should get out, give a shout out to Vision Films for uh, getting this film uh, released. Um, so Sean, we were talking about, uh, I agree with you, let's not just always use the N word. Uh, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, all these bands that really hit it huge then. Um, alternative music essentially goes mainstream it, in essence and becomes commercially viable, but what, at what cost? And I think your film captures this very well. There are probably some bands that the film explores who just were not meant to have a bigger audience i mean yes these um there were there was a lot of weird politics about selling out and stuff back then yeah. which no one really cares about now but exactly. that was big back then um but you know look there were a lot of bands who just weren't weren't inherently destined to appeal to the mainstream not because they were bad but because a band like drive like jehu yeah. Uh, or a band like Sleep, who made the best one song album ever, uh, were just not, they weren't going to, you know, be on the radio with, you know, the Backstreet Boys or, or something like that. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so it, it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit of a, a weird thing, this weird contradiction that was happening. And I think that, you know, through the, the I guess the main, the final point here is that uh, the scene kind of became polluted because it went from these underground bands doing something, I guess, pure to a degree where they were yeah. just doing it for the love of it to doing it. It went from that to going, okay, um, I've got to make sure that the bar is full of a &R people tonight and I've got to try to get a bigger advance than that band got last night and we've got to make sure that we have sponsors and that kind of thing so i think that that somehow crept into the music at some point at some point which is probably when you start to get all those like cookie cutter bands like yeah. you know, the nickelbacks and, and stuff like that which yeah. eventually happened at a certain point as well so i think that's how it sort of got polluted yeah i mean i guess you can't blame them i mean here these kids and they're I guess mostly in their twenties um, and you, a lot of money being thrown in front of them and they didn't know what the, the uh, music business was like. And I think your film also documents that quite well in terms of 
in a way I hadn't actually quite realized it. We all know each music scene. We've even had docs about other music scenes of other eras, but, uh, and you know, in the play between studios and labels and the, and the artists, but um, you know, the, as I think one of them says, you, you're not getting paid by the studio. You're actually paying the studio, aren't you? For these big budgets and these, these crews and, and tours that you're doing. I mean, all this money, uh, well, I, I think some bands in the film did owe the labels money and some didn't. But the thing is, you said something before about how they aren't to know. I, I've got a slightly different take on that. And I think Dave okay. Windorf um, touched on this quite eloquently. Uh, he was saying that in that thing with, because uh, this wasn't the first time that um, a record company or all the record companies mm -hmm. had come in and tried to co up the scene and, right. and, yeah. bands explode there's too many bands and the thing ends um he was saying that you know these were these were people who grew up listening to college radio and reading magazines and and that this wasn't a bunch of fresh-faced kids from the 60s going i like the rolling stones i want to do that too right these were people who did know that these things were happening but to be quite honest i think with a lot of these bands a the big problem was that they know that that kind of thing is going to happen, but they don't think it's going to happen to them because they think that they, they, that they have a plan that they're going to change the world somehow. And maybe they might just be that one that makes that difference. So I think that was a big part of it too. That's interesting. That is an interesting take. Um, and Dave, Dave Windorf's an excellent interview. Uh, he's he's yeah. had a, a lot of great scenes. Um, <laughs> also about how to sell records. Uh, but I think... <laughs> with a cigar in the mouth yeah exactly exactly and he's talking about oh you gotta do uh what does he say they want to, to i love what you kids are doing why yeah. don't you come over here you do it for us and it'll be exactly the same as what you do except more people will enjoy it yeah yeah and, you know and i think yeah so i think that is a i think that is a fair point they weren't so naive and uh, as you say it's a well or someone else said it's a warts and all doc so obviously uh you know some of these contracts for fueling drinking and drug habits and all kinds of stuff that was just rampant at, at that time. I was very happy that I, that I was able to also put the focus on what the bands did wrong as well without, yeah, you know, yeah. them whining or anything like that. Obviously you don't want that because that's not very yeah. um, flattering when, when someone on camera does that, which I don't think anyone did, but yeah. I mean, I think that they were very honest in how they um, looked at themselves, especially like, for example, Peter Mangade, when he gives this very <laughs> talk yeah. about what's and all. Um, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. It, 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 traveling around in the van and uh, things that were going on, on on tour and the band falling out. Yes. I, yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's uh, no spoiler alerts here. We're not going to go any further than that. That may not be appropriate for the podcast. Yeah, it might not be. I, you can cuss, but I think we got to have to be careful how far we go with that one. Just, just advise everyone to watch that scene uh, and you'll know what we're talking about. But uh, uh, yeah. And I mean, I think that's something too that you catch very well, which is uh, this, this energy, you know, this, it was so much about touring and, you know, um, and that's, that's certainly as someone who was going to these clubs in the 90s, from like late 80s on into the late 90s. I mean, that's what, uh, I mean, that was, you know, 200 person venues, these sort of things. And that's, uh, you know, and you get some big names in these little small venues. And that these, this, um, it was about, uh, you know, the, the energy and the, the, that you capture is amazing in, in this. Um, and, uh, you know, this sort of going on the road and being on the road. And it's not obviously a glamorous, certainly as these bands are, are starting out. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, I did want it to somehow capture some sort of energy. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd seen a lot of music documentaries where I sort of felt like shaking the person around who was speaking. And I was like, yeah. come on. Like, and I think at the time I started making this, the talking had documentaries were a lot more popular back mm -hmm. then they were, they were a lot more common and i know that mine is also essentially a talking head um documentary but i think the way we you know captured that energy and i say we as in me and 
J.B. Sapienza, who was a big part of forming the aesthetic of that film by the time it was complete. Uh, you know, it was obviously a mix of the personalities on screen who are, I mean, as you can uh, recall, there were some very interesting personalities <laughs> from Walter Kibbe to Dave Windorf yes. to yeah. many, many other names. Um, but it was also, you know, JB's animation, you know, uh, being splashed into there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I was very happy when I think it was one of the guys from Cop Shoot Cop who said, mm. like, you really captured the energy, like the reckless energy of that time. So that, that was cool to hear. I was very pleased. Well, let's get to the making of this film, I think, because uh, um, that kind of gets to this. I mean, uh, how did how did this film come about? I mean, um, as you say, you're a little younger. Uh, you didn't quite come of age as when some of this was happening, but you were, I mean, how did... You went from a love. This obviously you have a love for this this era and this music. How did that get you to then go take that next step, which or not just next step, next several steps to making a documentary? With great passion and naivety. So um, basically, I did contact all of these people who were in the film. I actually went and I contacted everyone who I thought I would want to speak to. Some people yet said yes, some people said no. I'd say about yeah. two thirds of the people I contacted said no, and a third of the people who said yes. So I tracked down a lot of people through like managers and their mm. websites and publicists and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I was just very lucky. The, the first people I approached about um, finances uh, were willing to give me whatever money I needed right out the gate to head out just in time to speak to all these people. So that sort of happened straight away. And then the whole editing and, and, and clearing of songs and all that stuff just took what, what felt like a lifetime. But I, I can't say I can complain all that much either because I think the film needed that time to gestate. And because, mm -hmm. for example, the animation that JB did, that happened like right, right near the end. So right. everything happens in its time. but yeah that was basically uh the rundown of how it all came together i mean as you mentioned there's and you only you know out of the people you reached out to you got a third but there's still so many and yeah. you could have easily focused on one or two bands but but you didn't i mean i think you've i mean uh there are bands i hadn't i didn't quite remember it to be honest um and uh you know, how did you manage to get them to say yes, get them on camera and uh, and get around to filming? I mean, there's, I mean, how much, how many interviews are there in this thing? Okay, so I was actually flying from Australia to the US. I'm based in Australia normally. Yeah. And um, I mean, look, I would just say that the people who agreed, they agreed because they agreed. I, I, I can't say why. But I mean, I can talk about why they were as maybe forthcoming as they were, because there were a lot of people in the dark who uh, maybe said things that you might not hear in your typical dark, like talking mm -hmm. about how they were, you know, you know, some mistakes that they made and, and things like that. And I think basically I did send them a very polished presentation of what I wanted to do. I, I hadn't, this wasn't the first thing I had made. I had made like short films and music videos and I had won awards mm -hmm. and things like that. And I did put together a website and I had interviewed mm -hmm. Peter Mangade from Helmet already. So he was included yeah. in the little package that I sent them and everything like that. So there was uh, a whole selling thing that I did to them to get them on board. Uh, but when I spoke to them, I think the fact that it was just me and my camera and us two in a room, it maybe brought some of the, the guard down that they might have had if there were an entire crew in the room with me. Yeah. And I think I got some really um, good stuff out of there. I, I, there was, it was a struggle to, uh, you know, there was so much other stuff I wanted to film yeah. in the film that I couldn't because there was so much good stuff that came out of the filming. So was that done intentionally or was that just budget? You only had budget to, for you and a camera to go around or did you think... Oh, no, pretty this much. Was... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it yeah. Was, it was budget, but it was... Uh, <laughs> I think the way I made this film was the perfect way that this kind of film needed to be made, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, I think it does make sense. I mean... Um, 
fortunate to get that money up front, but then I'm I'm sure I know enough about the film business to know it's not. I'm sure there wasn't a steady stream of money to help finance this thing. So, uh, um, but we were talking earlier about the energy you capture, and um, I think uh, where did you find all that archive? Because this is pre-smartphones, and you know you look at concerts now, and everyone's got their phone up, and they're all filming, and you know. You, there were people documenting that stuff back then. If if they weren't if they weren't in bands or writing zines, there were there were people going around filming their favorite bands and storing on VHS and trading tapes. And yeah. it was another part of this whole underground network that was happening. So it was a mix of finding those people and maybe just getting footage being sent to me from the bands who were in the film and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, you got a great concert footage of Fugazi. I thought that was uh, amazing. Um, and then, I mean, but that's between that, you've got all these great quotes in the, uh, I mean, you don't spend, I, I'm not talking up the picture well enough because people are going to think, oh, lots of talking heads interviews, reading quotes and things, but that's, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't really give a flavor of the energy that's in this film. But, uh, you, you know, you've got all these, I mean, a lot of these bands and bands that, I, you know, I said I wasn't that familiar with, you know, they got Rolling Stone quotes and they've got, you know, big name people. These, they were, they were definitely on people's radar screen, but as you said, you know, for various reasons, didn't make it big or maybe weren't really meant to make it big. These bands who, um, who I, I talk about in the movie had such a big impact on the musicians who came after them. Like, your average um, music listener might not know who Sunny Day Real Estate is, but probably every like fifth person that ever heard Sunny Day Real Estate back then started their own band. Like, it, I mean, yeah. all these bands like Sunny Day and um, Brad and, and Course of Empire, I mean, these bands made big, big impacts in the underground or jesus lizard i mean th these yeah. were not lightweights these are not like some guy who decided to like perform in a in a club one night and and who the who the hell is this these were i mean uh it's almost like as far as underground musicians go this film is almost like a like a who's who yeah. a list of yeah. those people i mean you got pepper keenan from corrosion of conformity you've got yeah. walter Schreifels from quicksand i mean you got Jay Robbins from Jawbox. How could I ask for any more? I mean, I might as well have Tom Hanks and Brad Pitt in my in my indie film or something. Yeah. As far yeah. As far. So yeah. Th this is why you see all these quotes from uh, these big publications, uh, uh, you know, pinned onto some of these clips because yeah. these were very important bands to some people, even if they didn't sell um, a zillion albums. Yeah, and. I, we, we mentioned Dave Windorf already uh, of Monster Magnet, but uh, I think it's him very early on. And it's, uh, I, I've seen it mentioned elsewhere that this is the, he calls it the last physical rock scene. And what do you think he meant by that? What does it mean to you that this is sort of the last physical rock scene? Well, things changed quite a lot after when the internet came around. I mean, uh, I mean, by 95, I mean, I don't know if broadband was around quite then, but people were definitely using dial-up and everything. And then, I mean, with the internet now, I mean, if you if you share these interviews with, um, I don't know, what's his name, like Ariel Pink or whatever his name is, yeah. he's actually, he actually says, he's like, what scene? Like when people ask him, tell me about the scene that you're at, he's like, well, well, there is no scene that exists. I didn't come out of any scene. So this was very much, um, uh, this, this film that has been made, Underground Inc., very much captures that spirit of all these people from all these cities um, a different, uh, around the US and, and further out as well, mm -hmm. you know, touring, um, trading you know uh, board and shelter and um you know uh, uh clubs that were set up with uh little labels you had clubs you had labels you had houses for people to stay when they toured this was all this this growing network that was all mm. uh, in the real world i mean i'm i'm sure that there's some sort of scenes that happen now but they're not as reliant and as grounded mm. as 
uh, this need to do things in the physical world as, as they were back then. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, one thing, the only thing I would say that's, and I don't, it's not, it's not missing. It's just for me personally, that the only thing I would say is missing is that it's not missing. It's there, but I just kept thinking of all the different clubs, you know, there's this whole, it wasn't officially a network, but there was this network of clubs from these little sort of satellites throughout America where you knew if you wanted to see this kind of music, that, well, you've got to go here, you know, you've got to go to the 930 club or the black yeah. club in Washington DC, or you've got to go, uh, I used to live in Boston, you got to go to the Middle East, you've got to, you know, these sort of things. And I think that's, uh, rap, so, yeah, so, yeah, you know, all these, uh, I was in North, lived in North Carolina, so the Cat's Cradle and Chapel Hill would have some of these, you know, bands coming through. And it's like, um, it was, it, it was very, it, you know, I think what I didn't appreciate at the time, what your film helps me realize is how unique and special in some ways that fit, that era was we just i just thought we all thought that that's just the way it was you know yeah that's the truth and yeah. um and you know and like you said how did you i mean i was oblivious to it but then uh, i was working one one summer and a guy gave me a tape he says you might want to listen to some of this music and i listened to it and it's like some of these some of the bands that feature in your uh in your doc are in there and i'm like i was like you know you you talk about the, you know, there's this, uh, there's this idea that that generation was an angry, angry young men and, and women. Uh, what was angry was, what made me angry is why hadn't I heard any of this music before? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy that you're saying that because that was the whole reason. I, I wanted people to know that these other bands existed. But I mean, uh, look, I mean, there were a lot of bands back then and there are a lot of bands now. And I, I think it's... Um, it's 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 an interesting story about how um you know underneath all of this um you know all of this indie stuff it all came down to at the end of the day how many albums that you were going to sell that whole yeah. capitalist aspect that that maybe led to um you know I, I think i think if you were in the city you would hear about these bands like what, what city did you grow up in in the u.s well i grew up in san antonio texas so uh that didn't really have as much oh well you see i was a little bit for various reasons oblivious to any scene that might have had what i did know about was the sex pistols came and they caused a riot in san antonio it's documented in, in a film uh and it makes everyone from san antonio very proud that this yeah. <laughs> that this thing happened, but you know there are the cool ki- you know I've, you know you're talking about the different groups. Yeah, I look, been... there are there are people who kept their ear to the ground, but I mean exactly. I think that if you're going to shows back in the day. Let's say you grew up in Dallas, you would know about Course of Empire, right? Or you would know about the Toadies or or, or whatever well, band yeah. in Dallas. I mean, the Toadies became huge. So that's a bad yeah. example, but um, um, you, you know you would. I think it was you mentioned clubs before. And I think it was a case of, you know, if you were in that local scene, if you were a part of it, that's the only way you could find out about these bands. But if you were just uh, someone who might just tune in on the radio, then you mm. might not hear about them. So yeah. you mentioned how I left out a lot of stuff about clubs, which really just came down to um, it's not all that interesting to have a whole list of names of clubs rattled off. I agree. Because you have to... Uh, work with things in the edit that complement the the narrative of yeah. that feeling of the you know, narrative moving forward. But then also on top of the clubs, you also had um, the radio. So another yeah. thing was the radio. So I, I guess most people find out about music on the radio, or at least they did back then, right? Yeah. Or MTV. So yeah. there's a lot of politics which uh, went into uh, what landed up on the radio and what landed up on MTV. And I could only touch on some of the stuff because I had so much material. Yeah. And at the end of the day, only so much of it is going to make it into an animated film. But I, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting can that you open when you talk about why a band gets big and mm. why it doesn't. Yeah. And I think, um, and no need to give a list of clubs. I mean, I think what you've done is you've shown what those clubs were like uh, by through all this, the, the, the live footage that you've got, you mm. haven't, it must have taken forever to track all this stuff down. I mean, um, and I think, you know, um, I, I saw Fishbone in concert and you've got a Fishbone um, footage in there. And I think it does a pretty good job of showing you what seeing a, going to a Fishbone concert would have been like. I mean, in, in talking to all these, uh, all these bands and musicians, I mean, what are the lessons they've learned? 
Oh, I definitely think there are lessons to be learned. I would say that the probably the biggest one is what uh, Steve Albini touches on about the bands who who have managed to continue making music are the people who have decided to you know take care of the business side themselves, and not the people who have hooked onto a bobsled and let a big record company take care of them. They're mm-hmm. the people who have decided to learn how how the business is run and 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 do all those things so they're not reliant on people who might potentially rip them off and i mean we're seeing that now with uh, so many of the bands who didn't do well back then are doing better now i mean a band like failure is is more successful now than they were back then by quite a large margin so uh there was a lot to be learned about you know rather than living the rock rock style mm-hmm. lifestyle it might be helpful to learn more about what caused all of this and avoid it by just doing it yourself so i think that that was probably the big lesson to be learned yeah i think there was a very good um because this you know like any any good doctor it's, it's going to be more than just about the the immediate subject and i think you do learn a lot about the music industry and i thought it was very interesting the point i forget which band it is and it wasn't it wasn't failure but uh uh the guy said look for atlantic we sold i don't know hundreds of thousands of albums and we didn't make any money off of that at all and you know but we uh we've gone back to being independent labels or however they're doing it and selling a lot fewer records but certainly from a financial standpoint they're at least seeing some of the money um yeah 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 that was clutch that yeah was it was clutch. clutch yeah who are really doing much better than they used to back when they were when they were bounced around from one major to the next because yeah. they were on like three or four majors yeah. and um yeah that was uh i, I love the different perspective that neil, neil fallon gave to that yeah. like you know, some bands thought it was like, you know, some sort of thing to be afraid of if they got dropped. And he was like saying, like, when we got dropped, we thought we took these jokers for a ride. They got exactly. a bunch of money to go out and tour with these bands and these yeah. bands and yeah. sucked in. You signed us up and look, look what we got to do with that money. So it's, um, it, it's very, um, very uh, eye opening. Yeah. And uh, I think you've touched on it already. Uh, you've talked about how influential these bands uh, are. Um, mm. But uh, what do you think is Alternative Rock's legacy? I would say that that music, it definitely changed the way that people accept a certain style of music. From what I understand, before that happened, uh, you know, if you, you know, you either liked pop or you either liked punk or you liked country and and yeah. and grew you if you know you liked something else and i think that now there are all these weird subgenres that have come out that have been a result of that i mean i yeah. found out the other day that there's something called um uh i can't remember it's like a mixture between like shoe gaze and black metal it's called like black gaze or something like that <laughs> it, 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 there's all these really weird weird combinations yeah. which some of them I don't get, but <laughs> uh, some of them are really good. Um, but there's all kinds of like bizarre combinations of music, and it really broke open uh, any limitations of what is possible in you know uh, any kind of music, I suppose. And I guess that that's what their legacy was. Yeah, and I think, and probably also what it comes out too in the film is that um, you know these guys had influences that were you know not just their own whatever however you want to call their genre they you know they would have been influenced by uh um what was happening certainly with like well you mentioned it with uh hip-hop and sampling and things like that that was going on at the time so um no i think i think that is a very good way of of putting it uh, that you could um you don't have to fit into some sort of um, category you can mix all kinds of influences together you can have yeah i mean you know, like i mean who would think that something like hip hop could influence something like industrial they're so yeah so like polar opposite i mean i was listening to um this cop shoot cop album the other day called white noise and i mean cop shoot cop they're quite noisy before they got to the point that you saw them in this film yeah. but there were this very uh dirgy kind of 
um, impenetrable sounding band, but you listen to that album, White Noise, and you can hear that production aesthetic of like the Bomb Squad from Public Enemy in there. You know, it's yeah. all yeah. it's all bleeding into each other. You know, it was it was very very inspiring. Yeah, and I will say that uh, that that tape that turned me on to this music was uh, it had that mixture. It had Public Enemy on there mixed in with you know bands like like this so you know it's 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 i think what people were picking up on anyway you know that uh good music's good music so um yeah um so what's what's next for you uh maybe buying a hammock and just relaxing (laughs) (laughs) um i I, look i mean you'll always have things that you want to make and it's Mm. just a matter of uh will you get a chance to do them I, i would like to go back to what I originally started, originally set out to want to make like um, fiction films. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't want to make a documentary after documentary. This was just something that I really loved and something that I wanted to do. Um, but I mean, I would like to try to veer back towards that one way or another. And I guess I'll see how that happens. And, um, uh, but I, I think the other thing that I just wanted to say was that, um, uh, for anyone listening to this um, podcast, you know, if they've seen the movie, go out and find these bands that we've been talking about. Actually go out and, and look for this music because it will change your life in very unexpected ways. Yeah, I well, I would second that, certainly. I mean, it's got me uh, going back out to the... Uh, all my old CDs are in the garden shed, so I need to go back and uh, a few of these, <laughs> uh, dig them out again. And... Uh, Right. Regardless of what my wife might think, and then, um, and then I, yeah, I, I agree. And then some of the ones that I hadn't hadn't been that familiar with, I was I was kind of blown away. I was like, why hadn't I heard of them? And I do do want to go uh, go search them out and and listen to them because um, it was. Uh, I mean, okay, I'm of my era, but uh, to me, some this, a lot of the music in there just seems so timeless. I oh, like which ones were the ones that you said why have I not heard of these bands. Um, I didn't know Cop Shoot Cop that really. Um, so, and they play largely, they, they have a large, I mean, you, you, do, you could have focused on one or two bands, but you didn't. I mean, you've got, um, um, as you say, we cover, we cover a lot of ground. It is, I think, the definitive doc of, of, of the scene. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, I think that would have been one. Um, what would have been another one? I was a little surprised I had wasn't aware of the one from um, what's the one from Dallas? Um, a Course of Empire. Yeah, I was a little surprised. Man, they are, I, okay, so t- Course of Empire, they made um, they made three albums, and the third album, uh, Telepathic Last Words, yeah. it is as ground shaking as. Um, you know, Nine Inch Nails, Downward Spiral, or Ministries mm-hmm. of the Mind is a terrible thing to taste. It is as mm-hmm. epic and as, like, towering as any of those really dark masterpiece, well-known mm-hmm. uh, recordings that came out of that time. So um, I-, I was really happy to have them involved. So I just wanted to plug that album because uh, I-, I really don't think enough people um, know about it. Well, you've heard it here, and I will now go go track it down and, and I don't know where I'm going to be able to find it. I don't think it's on Spotify, but, uh, oh, no, no, no. I think you, oh, no, no, no. I think that's the second album. I think, um, initiation mm. is now available on Spotify. That was second course of album, uh, course of empire album, yeah. but that's worth a listen to all, all that stuff is, but, um, yeah, find whatever you can of this stuff. It's, it's, it's very good. Okay. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, Sean, I think we're coming to the end of our time together. So um, I just wanted to thank you for coming onto the podcast. It's been uh, been a joy having you, and I hope hope you uh, hope wish you much success with the release on the on the twenty third. And um, if you do make another doc, uh, I'm sure it'll be a good one, and we'd love to have you back on. Thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, well, I just wanted to thank you, thank Sean Katz again, and. Um, I remind you, the film is Underground Inc., The Rise and Fall of Alternative Rock. Available in the U.S. and Canada on DVD and all major cable and VOD platforms, including iTunes, Amazon, Fandango Now, Vudu, and Google Play. I'll have to take a breath here. 
Uh, check local cable listings for availability. Uh, actually, do you know outside of the U.S. and Canada where if if this is going to be available wider? Because we have our audience is worldwide, actually. I'm sure it will be. Uh, yeah. It might not be available this month worldwide, but it will. I believe it should eventually roll out to all other territories okay. in the next few weeks or few months and things like that. Okay, so this will be releasing in time for the release uh, on the 23rd. But uh, for those listening to this podcast, if you're not in the in North America, uh, do do uh, search for it. I'm sure it will be uh, coming up uh, soon. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our engineer, Freddie Besbrod, and the rest of the team at This Is Distorted Studios in Leeds, England. Nevena Paunovic, podcast manager, who ensures we continue getting such great guests like Sean on the program. And uh, finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you. So please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.